Hi y'all, I'm Rob Young out here at Charlestown, West Virginia, and this is Young Harvest Farm. Uh, we're out here to give you a little idea of how we uh, begin our field prep and our beds, getting them ready for planting here in the spring. We got a couple different situations we're gonna run you through. Some of our field crops out here, things we're gonna grow. And then we also have some crops that are under cover. And we also have some that are a little more intensively managed for um, leafy greens. Now, looking out here, this field last year was pretty much our side field, uh, like you see out further out beyond the fence. And um, our ideal is to uh, respect the land and, and try to impact it as positively as possible. And so one of the things that tends to be a little destructive is our cultivation. And uh, there's a reason for it. And so we do it for that reason. And one of those being, um, we're trying to actually raise some beds here. But in order to kind of reduce a lot of the initial uh, moldboard plowing or heavy disking, uh, things that are really uh, beat up the soil, we've found a means to pretty much kill off the grass organically and um, allow it to have time to be digested into the ground. And uh, the means to that is the use of a silage tarp or landscape fabric like the one behind you. And this here is intended to pretty much smother out the light. Um, high moisture environment. So this here is actually just some weeds that got a little out of control. So you see them lifted up, but they're basically being uh, killed and uh, eaten by the microbes under this uh, tarp. Um, in the winter, you're looking at a couple months. In the summertime, you're looking at almost just a few weeks. Uh, what you're gonna find is, unless you have some really established grasses, Johnson grass or some rhizomes that are um, need a little extra time, you're gonna have a full kill of your uh, weeds. At this point, you still have structure from all of that life and the, that had been out in that pasture. So you don't really want to break it up um, too much because a lot of that uh, opening the soil is oxidizing the carbon that's already in there. So we want to keep that uh, in place. Now, what you found here, in order to have some good drainage, we like to kind of raise things up. Um, if you don't have the right tools, I wouldn't say it's 100% necessary, but it does allow if we have excessive rains for it to kind of shed off a little bit and uh, not have such wet roots. Now what we've done here, uh, this field, since it's pretty much going to be full of weeds here soon, we're going to kind of uh, tame it, we'll say. Now this field will be planted to some potatoes from which prior to planting them, we're going to add some basalt rock. Um, we like to think of these amendments as adding the minerals that aren't present and a soil test is typically the means of understanding that. But generally, most soils need some form of mineral and a, a very uh, good one would be a basalt rock, a volcanic ash rock, something that has an array of minerals. Um, if you find that your pH is around something or your ground's tight, you may add some gypsum, but here's your chance to put it in. Um, we're also going to add some organic matter. Um, we don't need tons because it is sometimes challenging to get a hold of. Uh, especially if you're trying to make it and you don't have animals bedding and things of that nature. Uh, some recommendations would be um, locally we have um, the Charlestown racetrack and uh, a lot of their horse bedding is composted for mushrooms so we get the spent mushroom compost. We utilize uh, leaf compost, things that the municipalities may have. It's nice to have them broken down a little bit, maybe year old. Um, we've also made our own We've, we've utilized uh, old potting soil that had peat moss. So any form of organic matter to try to feed the soil and open it up a little bit, get this uh, clay to loosen up. So what we're gonna do is add a little bit of uh, compost down the middle along with the basalt rock powder. And traditionally I would add just sparingly a little bit of rock, um, sorry, chicken manure or uh, alfalfa meal. All right, guys, now imagine we've just threw our basalt rock down, which uh, I'll give you a little example over here. Here's our mineral base here. We've got our mushroom compost that we've 
laid out. It's got a little blend of some pasteurized chicken manure. This has a little bit of rock phosphate, uh, some bone meal, and uh, I think some kelp, maybe even some cottonseed meal. These are just some slow release, a little bit of fast release. Um, I don't like to put a lot because often too much is hard to, to take away. So we add a little bit and we supplement our plants otherwise, but this has had basalt rock added, a little bit of the mushroom compost, and just a little bit of this uh, mix of fertilizer. And what we like to do, now that you can see it's on top, we like to keep things on the surface. And that being the place where a lot of the act microbial activity is, and one way to slightly make a nice seed bed that is not overly cultivated is to use a tool that we've found uh, called a rot power varrow. And the difference between this and a rototiller is instead of uh, it impacting in the downward sense and uh, inverting soil and bring it up, this one more or less churns it in a fashion that it, I can only go uh, an inch or two is usually ideal. Something where it's easy to just put your hand in. Now, what we're gonna do is this soil eventually will get looser and looser as its life is allowed to just thrive. We'll tend to occasionally bring a broad fork through here. If we found that this has got a little bit of a hard pan for some reason, it's a little bit of effort, but a broad fork will open it up without turning it. But generally by just cultivating the top, we find that the life that's let be underneath keeps the soil open. We get roots traveling down um, and it works real great. Um, I can do a quick example of this, how this works. This is a really nice seed bed from which we're going to do out here our pepper patch. So any crops that we feel like has a long term to it, the weeds are going to have plenty of time to grow. So we want to help the lack of time that we have by putting down some plastic mulch, biodegradable mulch we're experimenting with. Uh, anything that's going to actually push out the roots from the roots of the, the plant, the weeds, and hold some moisture. Um, we find the walkways, typically something will grow. Typically weeds that we uh, may not like the seeds or the rhizomous uh, roots. So this all here is to be planted with uh, a cover crop. Uh, one of the favorites that I find is a white clover. Uh, it doesn't grow too tall, even though that looks pretty big. And this here can easily be mowed down with a uh, weed whacker something that is actually holding the moisture so the in between the beds aren't drying out as much. Whatever life is in the soil, it, it's just a non-disturbed area. And we find that when it actually grows, we can either mow it back, keeping the crown so it grows back, or just stomping on it really brings it down. We've even brought rollers, but we find it's not much of a problem. Um, we still have plenty of air passing through and uh, all right, so from there, all right guys, here, um, for those of you that may not have the tractor and the, uh, the plastic mulch layer, maybe we offer another option. Uh, this is a landscape fabric. You can find this online and easily at Home Depot. These holes have been burnt with a little hand torch through a piece of plywood. And what we have here is the same idea of mulching. This here is going to be a long-term crop that we're about to put in of rosemary, some herbs and basil. Now this is going to allow the suppression of the weeds, a holding of the moisture. And these underneath here, we have some drip tape. The beds were treated the same way. We added the basalt rock, a little bit of the fertilizers. Um, we get some compost in there. It was shallowly cultivated. Now. I think if people only have a rototiller, just do it shallow. You don't need to go deep. Um, 
the roots will find their way in there, especially if they're following the worms down. We don't want to kill the worms. All right, guys. Now, plastic's everywhere. I know some of us want to just stay far and wide from it. So over here, we've got a, a little bit more intensive production. So these are our lettuces. We have some spinaches coming on, kales. These plants are not sticking around for super long. We might have them in the ground for two months. So we're going to treat these a little bit more intensively. The beds were prepped the same way. Instead of adding any mulches, we added a little bit more of the organic matter in this one to do a kind of a sheet mulching. This would be a, a weed-free compost if we have access to it. But here, because the weed seed bank is there, you kind of have to treat them a little bit. So these here, simple tools can help you take care of them. The key is to get them in the thread stage when they're small. You don't want anything when it's big. Now, when it comes to the walkway, this works great. We have a couple other tools that help too. When it comes to uh, weeds within the beds, we use tools that are, will raise some of the soil up, kind of do some smothering. But once you've done that once, you really can't raise it up too much more. We have finger weeders that we can add, but relatively cheap. This is a spring harrow. You can basically use a leaf rake. Maybe take a couple tines out of it. You're gonna want your plant to be a little bit established and you wanna do this before the leaves get broad like this lettuce. However, I can cut this lettuce, harvest it multiple times, and just after a harvest, I can run this rake. Now this rake is going to disturb those thread stage weeds that have very little resources to survive being brought to the sun. So once that little guy has been disturbed, ideally you do it in the afternoon, not before a rain, maybe one or two passes. But this about 10 days after your seeds come up or you put your transplants in, every you know 10 days, give it a nice rake, come back through. That is gonna take care of 90% of your weeds. And from there, when they come up, you can see them easy to manage. We also have some techniques that we can start prior to seeding this bed. We can create a stale bed where we prepared this bed, all the amendments, we prepped it with the power harrow, and we watered it as if we seeded it. And from there, the weed seeds come up, maybe takes a week. We can either torch it, not disturbing and bringing more weed seeds up. We can shallowly cultivate it, spring tooth harrow it. Uh, we basically eradicate them and then we can sow um, a pretty heavy seeding of greens. Great. Hello guys. Here we have another situation where uh, we have established a walkway cover crop, which makes it a little bit more challenge for us to take our cultivation tools to uh, put some uh, land, you know, the fabric on. So we've tried an experiment where we're using some biodegradable plastics, which break down. We've laid this over top of a prepared bed with drip tape. This has been, have a light covering of uh, whatever organic matter. And this has been seeded to uh, pole beans that we're gonna train up. And for the most part, this is gonna remain weed free. If we wish, we can overseed it once the beans have come with carrots things that will break through this plastic mulch that I don't anticipate lasting more than a couple weeks. It's gonna block the initial sprouting of these weeds, little grasses that might've been under there. And uh, from there, we're gonna have a dominant crop that's gonna take up the space. Um, what we also like to show you is a broad fork. This is that from which once we, uh, and I'd like to think of it uh, maybe once a year, it's very easy on the back, and it's just a simple opening up. This is particularly good in places that you feel like the fork doesn't go down. If you get a nice penetration, you're pretty good. Now this allows the moisture to go through. Sometimes you have organic matter that will percolate through. That'll uh, just get it down more. Here's another example of uh, one style of bed prep that we do. In our greenhouses, we do pretty intensive cultivation of leafy greens, as you can see. Um, we also do lettuces and head lettuces. Same technique, 
we do a broad forking. We add our amendments, the basalt rock, alfalfa uh, pellets, maybe uh, the occasional um, spread of the uh, pasteurized poultry manure. This here is all incorporated into the top of a mulch layer. Now, one idea that I found long ago was that if I could just smother out the weed bank from down below, now you can see my hand is going down into there. That's real loose. Now here's the clay. That clay is full of beautiful dirt, lots of hummus. You can see little worms crawling around in here, but I don't like that clay to come up. I like that to stay buried. Get back down there. And what I like is that old potting soil, that leaf compost, that mushroom compost. And what's happening here is those are weed free uh, organic matters that over time have broken down brilliantly. Um, and we seed into that living mulch. That living mulch is actually suppressing the weeds below. We don't cultivate in a way that brings the weeds up. We cultivate in a way that's keeping that stratification uh, maintained. And from there, that clay stays moist, which keeps it open. The life is constant, so the nutrients are cycling. And I think we get a little bit of cooling on the soil, especially when we're able to break this up and keep the wicking from uh, drawing up too much moisture from the soil. This kind of has a, will dry out faster than the whole under bank. Um, from there, we found it real easy to draw tools like a transplanting tool. This happens to be one of those small farming tools uh, that's in a paper chain. These are actually drawn through the soil and they unfold, drawing uh, a small uh, transplant into the ground. Really nice when they're actually smaller than you want to handle them. And the other option we have is uh, direct seeding. The direct seeding in here is really nice because we do have some overhead sprinklers. Um, a lot of this direct seeding requires a very wet seed bed, so drip tape works good, but the initial watering and keeping it moist for the first week or so is pretty critical for germination, but we use a precision seeder. Um, this is not required. I've done broadcasting. Um, broadcasting can create overseeding um, if you could be real good about it. Otherwise, you can create furrows with some space, and then you direct seed giving space for each of those. And we have different seeders that can speed that up, but you can recreate the same thing on your own. Use the end of your rake handle, make some lines. Nothing has to be perfectly straight. You just need room to walk. And uh, from there, you can see the weeds are minimal. Anything we see coming up, we're eventually gonna use our undercutting tools just to undercut it, give it a little dry out time. You can see this cilantro looks great. We'll get usually three cuts out of everything. Then we pull it all, put all the organic matter into the compost pile, and then we start over. We fork it if needed, add a little more organic matter if needed, do the little bit of amending, and usually it's planted uh, in the next day or two right after being pulled.